Welcome to, historically speaking, the first program in a series of talks and lectures on the significant events, places, and people in St. Mary's County. People and events whose lives and accomplishment echo within and beyond the county's borders. Among the additional programs planned this year include Who Came First? State Declarations of Independence and States' Rights in the Revolutionary Era with Judge Dan Friedman of the Maryland State Court of Appeals, and Maryland, the first casualty of the Civil War with Professor Bott Talbert of Salisbury University. The Historically Speaking program is made possible in part by a generous grant from Southern Maryland Heritage Area and the Maryland Heritage Area's Authority. My name is Peter Laporte. I'm the Executive Director of the Historical Society. On behalf of our directors, volunteers, and members, I'd like to thank the board of the Patuxent Na River Naval Air Museum, and particularly Pete Butt and Ma Amy Davis, the director of this wonderful museum, for allowing us to be here today. This has been and continues to be a trying time for all of us, but these tribulations don't mean that we should remain idle. And so, taking appropriate safeguards, we are pleased to bring you today's program. Our speaker is Bob Treville, a volunteer historical researcher and exhibit designer at this magnificent museum. It is a position that allows him to continue his lifelong passion for aviation. Bob and his wife, Regina, have been proud to call Southern Maryland their home since arriving here in 1997 with the Naval Air Systems Command. Before retiring from NAV Air in 2014, Bob spent nearly 35 years working as a systems engineer across a number of technology areas and as the Navy's chief engineer for several aircraft programs. While Patuxent River Naval Air Station is renowned for its role in aircraft testing, the base's rich history as the home port for fleet squadrons is less well known, and that is Bob's theme today. His topic, Pax River's Forgotten Cold Warriors, reveals a part of the Naval Air Station's history about which few people are aware. He will outline the missions and challenges of these operational squadrons during the Cold War. It is a riveting story. The accomplishment of these aviators, technicians, and specialists form a nearly forgotten chapter in St. Mary's County and Southern Maryland history. They are worth remembering. Bob? Thank you very much, Peter, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, today's topic. I put together this presentation, which I'm calling Naval Air Station Patuxent River's Forgotten Cold Warriors, because I think that if many of us hear the words Pax River and Cold War, the imagery that comes to mind isn't necessarily fully descriptive of everything that took place in this era. Yes, we had people at the base who were testing the first generation of jet aircraft, we had people training to be test pilots, and we had people here who were going to become astronauts. But there was much more going on here at the base than just that. In fact, we had people in fleet squadrons, operational squadrons, who were performing missions and in many cases were quite dangerous. And those are the cold warriors that we're going to focus on today. So what did these Pax River cold warriors do? Their activities really fall into six unique mission areas, and I'm going to talk about each of those areas today. The first area is electronic intelligence. We had people here from Pax River who were doing electronic intelligence, or ELINT, of the Soviet Union. We had people from Pax River who were performing nuclear strike missions in the Mediterranean, thankfully not dropping any actual bombs. We had people from Pax River performing airborne early warning missions uh, across the North Atlantic. And we had people performing maritime patrol missions literally everywhere that Soviet submarines operated. We also had people from Pax River going to Vietnam, providing airborne television broadcasts. And lastly, we have and still have people who perform from Pax River the important job of providing strategic communications between the National Command Authority and our nuclear forces. 
Let's talk about the first of these areas. In each of these topics, I'm going to be starting things off with a little background information to put things in context. The background information on this particular topic, electronic intelligence, or ELINT, takes us back to the Cold War in the, area, in the era after uh, World War II ends. After World War II, the Soviet Union is an enigma. They're doing many troubling things. You can come up with your own list, but they took Czechoslovakia, they blockaded Berlin, they detonated atomic bombs, and then they detonated hydrogen bombs. The problem is we in the West had very little understanding of what the Soviet Union's capabilities were, what their intentions were. We lacked the ability because we didn't have human intelligence resources on the ground inside the USSR to really discern what was happening. We had no means to overfly the Soviet Union until 1952. And to put that in context, the U-2 didn't come around until 1955. So to fill that 10-year gap between the end of World War II and the emergence of the U-2 as a spy aircraft, we used another technology, electronic intelligence. We filled former patrol aircraft, former bombers, former cargo airplanes with specialized equipment, receivers and antennas and highly trained operators who could sniff the air for radio transmissions and for radar transmissions coming from the Soviet Union to help give us some insight into what's going on. And as it turns out, a squadron that did those activities was based right here at Pax River. That squadron is VP-26. They flew the airplane you see on the screen for two years between 1948 and 1950. They operated that aircraft in, from two places, Pax River and a place in Morocco called Port Liaoti. Port Liaoti in this period of time was very sensitive, very austere. A lot of highly secure, classified Navy work took place at Port Liaoti. In fact, in this period of time, the Navy didn't even acknowledge operating from Port Liaoti, even though it's kind of hard to uh, camouflage the fact that these big gray airplanes were flying in and out of there. But that was the Cold War. So at Pax River, what VP-26 did is they flew maritime patrol missions, just as you would expect a VP squadron to do. They did anti-submarine warfare training. But at Port Liaoti in Morocco, the mission was very different. The detachment that was set up uh, of VP-26 in Port Liaoti uh, deployed to bases in England and West Germany. And from those bases in England and West Germany, they patrolled the Baltic coast and the coast of the Adriatic and did this secret, highly covert electronic intelligence gathering work. Now, their aircraft in Morocco were configured very differently than the aircraft here at Pax River. The aircraft at Pax River were patrol aircraft. In Morocco, the aircraft were completely customized, filled with electronic intelligence gathering equipment and naval intelligence personnel. There was a cover story. They were said to be doing embassy duties. They were said to be delivering cargo and mail and so on. The Soviets didn't buy that. They knew what was really going on as these airplanes are patrolling around their coastline. Everything works well until one Saturday morning in April of 1950 when an airplane takes off out of Wiesbaden, Germany and doesn't come back. That aircraft is the one you see on the screen here. It's the turbulent turtle. There was an intensive search that VP-26 and some other aircraft took part in that the Soviets did their best to hamper. Eventually, bullet-riddled wreckage was found in the sea. We learned the truth about what happened to the turbulent turtle from Sweden which had provided the U.S. very secretly with air-to-ground uh, radio transmissions that they had recorded that showed that four of these Lovachkin 11 propeller-driven fighters had shot down the turbulent turtle near Latvia in international waters. That was the first U.S. aircraft shot down by the Soviets outside a war zone during the Cold War. Unfortunately, it was not the last. And oh, by the way, the 10 people on board, we don't really know what happened to them. There's been a lot of rumors over the years that they were interned by the Soviets, that some of them were kept captive, and some of them may have been executed. Nobody knows, or if somebody knows, it's never been revealed to us. But after the shootdown, what happens is the Navy decides we're not going to operate in the Baltic anymore. And so they shut down the Baltic intelligence gathering operations for two years. They disestablish VP-26's Morocco detachment. And VP-26 gets out of the ELINT business entirely. And now they're a pure patrol squadron. In fact, they change airplanes. They go from the PB-4Y aircraft that we showed you earlier to this aircraft you're seeing right now, the P-2V. But ELINT has to take place. It's got to go on. And so just a few months after the shootdown, the Navy forms a brand new covert unit out of Morocco called the Naval Air Activities Port Liaudi Patrol Unit, which thankfully has an easy acronym, NPU. NPU used the airplanes that VP-26 formerly operated. Why am I talking about this? 
Well, as it turns out, Pax River was not yet out of the Elint business because only a couple years later, that activity at Port Lealty, this NPU, gets attached to another Pax River squadron. It gets attached to a squadron called VW-2, an airborne early warning squadron that we'll be talking about in a little while. And that detachment, VW-2, Detachment A, covertly flew the airplane you see on the screen, the P4M-1Q Mercator, doing the same kinds of missions that the former VP-26 aircraft did. A couple of years later, Pax River gets out of the ELINT business, presumably for good, when VW-2 Detachment A becomes a squadron in its own right. It becomes VQ-2, Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron 2. For each one of these topics, I'm going to be bringing uh, some closing thoughts uh, out, maybe some things that I, I want to highlight. In this case, my thoughts are revolving around secrecy, tragedy, and a Cold War that really wasn't very cold at all. If you go back to April of 1950 and the months following that, you're not going to read anything about a spy airplane being shot down. You're going to read about a patrol aircraft on a training mission that the Soviets blasted out of the sky. It wasn't until 1975 that details emerged regarding the Turtles' real mission. That was the Cold War. It took 25 years for that fact to be revealed. Later still, we learned about Pax River's role in uh, owning uh, the mother squadrons that did these ELINT missions out of Port Liaudi. And tragically, we also learned that in the 25 years after the end of World War II, some eight Naval Forces aircraft were shot down. Coast Guard, Navy, and Marine Corps aircraft were shot down with the loss of 81 American lives. If you add on the Air Force and other government agency aircraft that were shot down, there's a total of about 400 Americans that, were, that lost their lives during the Cold War doing intelligence gathering missions. And a lot of that started right here at Pax River, tragically. We're talking about the Cold War. You can't talk about the Cold War without talking about nuclear war, the threat of nuclear war. And Pax River played a role in nuclear warfare. They played that role for four years. To put this in context, in the years immediately following World War II, the Air Force is given the mission of flying over the Soviet Union and doing the deep strike atomic bombing of places like Moscow and the big cities. But the Navy says, look, we can participate in nuclear war should we have to. We can operate aircraft from aircraft carriers that can strike the outer regions of the USSR from carriers. And we're going to do that with two types of aircraft. The aircraft you see on the screen is a modified land-based patrol aircraft that was given the ability to carry an atomic bomb and to take off from an aircraft carrier, this P2V3C. The other aircraft that was going to do this atomic strike mission is the other aircraft I just brought up called the AJ Savage. This was an aircraft purposely designed around the atomic bomb. And so for eight years, from 1948 to 1956, composite squadrons of those two types of aircraft gave the Navy its first nuclear strike capability. And three of those composite squadrons were based right here at Pax River. It made sense for those squadrons, VC-6, VC-7, and VC-8, to be based here at Pax River because the P2V3Cs and the AJs that they operated uh, had been tested here from their very beginning. Uh, so it was a logical thing to continue those uh, training and testing operations and moving into the operational realm. And that's, in fact, what happened. Interestingly enough, these are the only three squadrons ever based at Pax River that routinely deployed to aircraft carriers. And deploy they did. These three squadrons deployed to Port Lealty, that same Port Lealty that we talked about in the previous topic, a total of six times in the four years that they were operating heavily here at Pax River. And what they did at Port Lealty is they deployed two aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean, at least the AJ Savages did. The P2Vs we'll talk about, they didn't deploy to the carriers. And what the AJs did, though, is they provided that nuclear strike capability, the aircraft right here from Pax River, uh, so that if the need uh, emerged, they could strike Eastern Europe with atomic bombs. Let's talk about the AJ Savage. The AJ Savage was the first fully carrier-capable aircraft ever designed for an atomic bomb. It could carry all of the U.S. atomic bombs in that era. You see the, the, the Mark VI bomb being depicted in this illustration. The Mark II through Mark VIII bombs were, were the bombs in vogue at that time. They all had basically the same size and roughly the same weight. They were about 10,000 pounds. You can see, though, in the black and white photograph, one of the limitations of the AJ Savage was its enormous size. These are big airplanes, and the carriers of the day were much smaller than the carriers nowadays. 
They were also very complex airplanes. These airplanes were operated, were powered by both a jet engine and two propeller engines, and frankly, they were rushed into production. There were a lot of growing pains. There were hydraulic system issues, there were wing fold issues, there were bombing system issues. As a consequence of all that, the, air, the uh, carrier commander said, look, if you want us to continue doing our day job, all the things that we're supposed to do with our carrier air wing, you can't saddle us with too many of these AJs for this niche nuclear mission that we don't think we're ever going to have to perform. So as a consequence, only three or four of these AJs were ever on a carrier at any given time. They were really never fully integrated into carrier operations. The P2V3 Neptune, uh, by contrast, started out as a patrol aircraft, as a land-based patrol aircraft. Uh, it was given the ability to carry an atomic bomb and to launch from aircraft carriers. It had enormous range. It, in fact, demonstrated in 1948 the ability to fly from the east coast of the United States from an aircraft carrier to drop a simulated 10,000-pound atomic bomb in California and to, then to fly back to the east coast and land here at Pax River all in one mission nonstop. So the Navy could put a very compelling case together that said, look, these airplanes that we're, that we're putting here at Pax River, they can, they can actually do the atomic mission. The Navy bought that to a point because the, these airplanes were really very limited, as it turned out. They could launch from carriers only if they used something called JATO, Jet Assisted Takeoff. You can see in this illustration what kind of an impact that has on carrier operations. It's not something you want to be doing routinely. And then moreover, after a mission, you couldn't land back on the aircraft carrier. We could never figure out how to put an arresting hook on this aircraft without tearing it apart. And so you either had to find some place ashore to land, or you had to ditch in the ocean somewhere. And lastly, you had a crew of seven, uh, which is a great complication to carrier operations. So when you look at those facts, and the facts that this aircraft could only carry one type of atomic bomb, an atomic bomb that frankly was obsolete, the Mark I bomb that we used on Hiroshima, this airplane never deployed on carriers. If we had to use this aircraft in anger, we would have winched it on board with a crane, on board an aircraft carrier with a crane. The carrier would have floated off and the airplanes would have blasted off and done their damage, but nobody ever really thought that very practical. And as a consequence, this aircraft was withdrawn from composite squadrons by 1953. To try to put a bow around this topic, I bring up two, uh, two thoughts. One is security and the other is danger. Here at Pax River, the local folks knew that the AJ Savages were based here. You couldn't miss these really large aircraft flying in and out of Pax River. There was no secret to the fact that they were here. But they weren't necessarily told what those aircraft were doing. If you ever looked at the local paper, even at the base paper, and this is an excerpt from the base paper called The Tester, you would see words like they're highly classified, there's barbed wire, there's marine guards, astringent security, but you wouldn't see the words atomic bomb and AJ Savage used together very often. If you were a, an aviation buff, you would know what these airplanes do, but as a local, you probably didn't. And oh, by the way, any atomic bombs here on base would have likely have had no fissile material in them at all. They would have been inert. They would have been electrically identical to an atomic bomb. They would have had all the mechanical interfaces. They would have been used for training, and they would have been used for testing. But to the best of my knowledge, there are no live weapons stored here. Those were stored on the aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean and at Port Leoti. The danger part is what I want to close with, though. These were really difficult times, very dangerous aircraft. Uh, we lost a total of five AJs from Pax River and six crewmen. And you can see in this particular case, an AJ went into the water, and this crew is, like, is lucky enough to have gotten out. Others were not quite so fortunate. Next topic is airborne early warning. Again, we'll go back to the era after World War II when the Soviet Union is developing uh, atomic bombs and the ability to deliver those bombs. They copy a US B-29, which can carry their atomic bombs. A few years later, they develop a hydrogen bomb, and then they develop an, uh, an aircraft called the Tu-95 Bear that can drop those hydrogen bombs on the US and then get back to the Soviet Union unscathed. It's very important for us to detect those aircraft before they come into American airspace. The Navy does its part by putting land-based AEW aircraft, uh, uh, deploying those aircraft in a way that will hopefully do that job. And for over 15 years, some of those AEW aircraft were based right here at Pax River. <clears throat> Pax River's first AEW aircraft are the ones you see here. They came from Kwanzaa Point, Rhode Island in 1948 from a squadron called VX-4. And that squadron had experimentally modified some B-17s and Lockheed Constellations with the first generation of AEW radars. So you can see uh, the ray domes for those, uh, the antennas for the AEW radar circled on the screen. And even though these, these were experimental aircraft, they were very quickly put into operational use on something called barrier missions. So the first barrier that got stood up was something called the Atlantic Contiguous Barrier. 
This was a racetrack up and down the East Coast where aircraft from VX-4 here at PAX teamed with radar picket destroyers on the surface of the water were linked with Air Force interceptor squadrons to detect and ideally shoot down Soviet bombers before they penetrate American airspace. So crews from PAX River flew this mission for over eight years. In 1956, though, that barrier has to get moved north. And so now the Atlantic contiguous barrier is replaced by the Atlantic barrier. And that's in place for about five years, and it fills a gap between Newfoundland and the Azores. And now it's no longer experimental aircraft flying these missions. Now we have three active duty operational AEW squadrons here at Pax River doing these missions, VW-11, VW-13, and VW-15, and they're flying state-of-the-art AEW aircraft. And they're doing that out of a place called Argentia in Newfoundland, a very cold, forbidding place these squadrons would deploy from Pax River to Argentia, fly these Atlantic barrier missions, uh, and do so uh, round the clock for the better part of five years. By 1961, though, it becomes obvious that the Soviet threat is getting even more dangerous, and so that barrier gets moved even further north to fill the so-called Greenland-Iceland-United Kingdom gap. And that's an extension of the uh, distant early warning, or so-called dew line, if you remember that. And so now it's no longer crews from Pax River who are flying uh, these barrier missions, but rather the crews that are flying those missions are being trained by Pax River uh, Squadron AEW Training Unit Atlantic, because the three operational squadrons that were here have been moved to Naval Station Argentia. The aircraft they're operating, the WV-2, which later be called the EC, uh, was later called the EC-121K, was flown by those five a uh, AEW squadrons that we talked about being based here. There are a lot of them in flight at any given time. For each one of these barriers, there are around two to four airplanes in the air at any given time. You had one or two aircraft flying the racetrack, the barrier, and they were, there was always an aircraft coming off station and an aircraft coming on station, and they were busy around the clock 24-7. The missions were hellish. There were a minimum of 10 hours, very often 14 hours, averaging around 12 hours. And the weather they were operating in put them in the teeth of the North Atlantic's worst weather. They were operating between five and 20,000 feet. The radars were very powerful. They had about a 250 nautical mile range. Uh, they also had an enormous degree of complexity on the order of 3,000 vacuum tubes. You can imagine that with uh, a uh, flight of 12 hours duration, you had a full-time radar maintainer on board, if not two, just to do nothing but change vacuum tubes when they started to fail. These were unarmed airplanes. They were unarmored airplanes. But the danger to the crews uh, was not from being shot down by the Soviets so much as it was fatigue and weather. Let's talk about those crews. With this duration of mission, there were two full crews on each one of these airplanes. Uh, so the, every position on the aircraft would rotate every three to four hours, and folks would try to get as much rest as they could between stints. There were five radar stations, again, with two crews, 10 to 12 controllers. And with the technology of the time, there was no automation, no filtering. The radar tracks were manually plotted with a grease pencil. You can see circled here what that looked like. If a bogey was identified, it was reported uh, by radio to uh, ground controller to uh, provide interceptor aircraft, uh, and very often using Morse code. That was the kind of technology of the day. These are perilous missions. And in fact, during these deployments, at least five Pax River WV-2s and a total of 34 men lost their lives doing this mission. That's the price of freedom during this period of time. So we talked about the role Pax River played in detecting Soviet aircraft. Pax River also played a role in detecting Soviet submarines. The submarine threat was a big deal because in the era after World War II, the USSR had over 100 large patrol boats and large attack submarines. And they continuously updated those submarines, and they built new submarines, and they built increasingly better weapons for those submarines. So that by the early 1950s, Soviet submarines were carrying the first generation of cruise missiles with nuclear warheads on them. And they had a 150-kilometer range. By the mid-1970s, the Soviet submarines were capable of launching true intercontinental ballistic missiles. It was very important for the Navy to know where all those submarines were at any given time. And we used both carrier-based and land-based aircraft to do that. And some of the land-based aircraft were based right here at Pax River, and they were based here for the better part of 40 years. There are two discrete periods of time in which patrol aircraft were based at Pax River. The first period of time was 1948 to 1954, and there were three squadrons that were doing this maritime patrol mission. We already talked about the first one, that's VP-26. These are the folks who did the electronic intelligence mission we talked about uh, at the beginning of this presentation. 
Second of these squadrons is VP-21. They flew three different kinds of aircraft. They flew the PB-4Ys that we talked about with VP-26. They flew an aircraft called the P-4M, and they flew uh, P-2Vs. I want to talk just for a moment about the P-4M. They were the only squadron in the Navy to ever fly the P-4M as a patrol aircraft. In fact, it was their experiences with this aircraft that led the Navy to conclude the P-4M is a lousy patrol aircraft. And in fact, they converted all the P-4Ms, including VP-21's old airplanes, into electronic intelligence aircraft. So guess what? VP-21's old aircraft ended up getting attached to that VW-2 Detachment A Elint squadron that I talked about earlier. So there's a tie between this topic and the first topic that we talked about. The last of the three squadrons that were here between 1948 and 1954 is VP-24. They had a primary mission of aerial mine laying, and of course, like all the other squadrons, they flew the PB-4Y2 privateers, but they did something very different. They were the only East Coast squadron to operate uh, something called the ASM-2 BAT missile. This was an enormous uh, air-to-surface radar-guided missile, uh, and they carried this during the entirety of their six years at Pax River. And then when the squadron came back to Pax River, they, as an homage to this period of time, they had a little bat logo painted on their tail. So if we fast forward seven years, nothing's happening for patrol aviation here at Pax River. But when patrol aviation comes back to Pax River, it does so in a very big way. In fact, during the 1960s, Pax River is the most important patrol aircraft base on the East Coast. And there were a total of five deployable active duty squadrons based here. The first of these is VP-8. They show up at Pax River in 1961 with P-2 Neptunes, and within a year they transition to P-3 Orions. They're in fact the Navy's first P-3 squadron. The Navy's second P-3 squadron, VP-44, showed up around the same time, and they were quickly followed by VP-49, VP-24, there you see the bat logo on the tail, and a squadron called VP-56. The reason I bring this up is that I'm trying to emphasize how important a place Pax River was for patrol aviation in, in the 1960s. To give you an idea, in the peak P-3 era at Pax River the, in 1970, there were 70 P-3s based here. That's those five deployable squadrons we just talked about, plus a training squadron I'm going to talk about. At the other two P-3 bases on the East Coast, there were only a total of 30 P-3s combined. So we had more than twice as many P-3s, operational P-3s based right here than all the other East Coast P-3 bases. I mentioned the training squadron. That was VP-30. They were here for 13 years. If you're going to be in a P-3, either flying it or in the back of the aircraft, you were trained by VP-30 here at Pax River. We also had two reserve patrol squadrons. VP-661 was the first of these. They showed up in October of 1961 during the Berlin Wall crisis. They were called up from the reserves and activated here at Pax River, and they were here for about 10 months when they went back to uh, Andrews Air Force Base from uh, their, their home port and returned back to the reserves. The second squadron, though, was VP-68, and they were here for the better part of 14 years. They initially came with the P-2s that you see on the screen, and they quickly transitioned to P-3 Orions. In fact, they only left Pax River in 1985 because the V-22 uh, test program was starting up here. So all these squadrons do what patrol squadrons always do, which is deploy. You can see some of the places uh, that they deployed ticked off with stars on this map. So these eight squadrons made a total of 42 deployments of six months duration or so, and that's what they do. And in fact, two of the squadrons here at Pax River uh, deployed to Vietnam. VP-8 and VP-44 uh, deployed to Southeast Asia in direct support of the Vietnam War, supporting something called Operation Market Time. Market Time was an attempt to interdict uh, the movement of North Vietnamese uh, men and supplies by boat down from North Vietnam into the south. It was, a, it was a big operation, and Pax River directly supported that. Closing thoughts on this topic are one of sacrifice. Yet again, are we coming we keep coming back to this. We lost a total of four patrol aircraft that were based at Pax River with almost two dozen fatalities. Again, these are perilous time, and these men would not probably call themselves hero. That word was as overused then as it, as it is today. They would have probably called themselves Americans doing jobs they were, they were asked to do. That's how I'd like to think about them. This topic is an interesting one. At the beginning of the Vietnam War, there were no television sets in Vietnam, there were no television stations in Vietnam, and in fact, the very first television broadcasts in Vietnam were made by an aircraft from Pax River. And in fact, aircraft from Pax River did television broadcasts for the better part of five years. And they did that as part of the, a part of the American Forces Vietnam Network, the Good Morning Vietnam uh, organization, if you remember the movie. 
All of that got started in 1960 when a squadron here at Pax River, VR-1, Fleet Tactical Support Squadron 1, modified two of their R-6D aircraft, and you see one of those on the screen here, to be aerial broadcast stations, effectively aerial radio stations. And their transmitters could use commercial civilian frequencies. The idea was if we ever had to use uh, aircraft for propaganda purposes overseas, or if we had a domestic emergency, we could do radio transmissions from these aircraft. And in fact, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was some thought about using these aircraft for propaganda purposes. To the best of my knowledge, these aircraft were only ever used for testing. They were never used operationally, and they were deconfigured at some point. So now if we fast forward, though, to the beginning of the Vietnam War, something called Project Jenny gets initiated. In 1965, somebody remembers the fact that we had modified uh, these VR-1 aircraft, uh, these R-6Ds with radio stations inside of them, and said, hey, why don't we do something like that with these big uh, C-121 aircraft? We've got a Pax River unit called the Operational Aircraft Support Unit, or OASU, which, by the way, was formed from the assets of the Airborne Early Warning Training Unit Atlantic. Remember them from the AEW topic we just talked about? There's another tie between these topics. Those aircraft uh, were looked at, and in fact, one of them was modified with radio transmitters, and they were sent to Saigon. And they brought sports radio to Vietnam. They broadcast the first game of the 1965 World Series live. They plucked the radio, radio signals out of the air and then very powerfully transmitted them to the ground. And then they broadcast all the other games of the World Series on a tape delay basis. Literally, as soon as the games were over, tapes were put on an airplane, flown to Vietnam, stuffed on board one of these aircraft. The aircraft would go flying, and the troops on the ground could listen to the World Series only a few hours after the games were played. As you can imagine, this was pretty powerful, pretty popular stuff. And so the idea came said, uh, to uh, the leadership saying, well, why don't we expand this capability and go beyond just radio and now bring television to Vietnam? And so several more of these OASU C-121s were modified. They were called Blue Eagle aircraft. They were modified now with television transmitters, and every night they provided TV broadcasts. Initially, they flew from Saigon, a place called Tan Sinut Air Base, and then the Armed Forces Vietnam Network was able to set up some ground-based TV stations that really obviated the need for the airborne TV stations. And so the Blue Eagle aircraft were moved north uh, to uh, Da Nang. Pax River got a fair amount of publicity during this period of time. Uh, Project Jenny uh, was in the newspapers, Washington Post, and other publications. Um, it wasn't without risk. Uh, fortunately, no, air, uh, no aircraft were lost, no people were lost, most fortunately. Uh, but three of these aircraft were damaged by Viet Cong ground attack, and, and they were actually brought back into the air within a short period of time. So what were, this, what were these Project Jenny aircraft, these Blue Eagle aircraft doing? I said at the onset there were no TV sets in Vietnam at the beginning of the war. So the first thing that had to happen is we had to get TV sets in Vietnam. And so the U.S. Agency for International Development actually placed TV sets in places like Saigon, where people gathered in, in large groups, and later on in some of the other major cities. And so civilians were able to get access to these broadcasts thanks to the USAID. What were they hearing? Well, there were two channels. There was a Vietnamese channel, there was an English channel. And they could see live shows from the aircraft, because a lot of these aircraft were actually configured with studios. Uh, but more often, on the Vietnamese channel, they were getting locally produced content. It could be a political speech from Saigon that was being relayed, uh, or a tape of those speeches. Uh, there were cooking shows in the Vietnamese language, those kinds of things. On the English channel, what the troops were getting was uh, tapes from ABC, from NBC, and CBS. And so a few uh, nights after we would watch Bewitched or I Dream of Genie, the troops were able to see that. Closing thoughts here, this is, I think, Project Jenny, my own personal view, was less about the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people than it was the hearts and minds of the U.S. troops. This was a big morale builder. Vietnam War obviously was not a very popular war. It was even less popular for the folks who were uh, in the jungle over there and trapped uh, in a conflict that they didn't want any part of. Project Jenny helped make them feel a little bit closer to home. Uh, if it's hard to imagine today in an internet era what it was like in an era uh, where you go to a place where there's not only no uh, immediate access to the internet, but there's no television. Project Jenny filled that gap. Uh, aircraft right here from Pax River, aircraft and crews right here from Pax River. The last topic is Pax River's role in strategic communications, and it starts in 1961 with something called Project Looking Glass. This is the Air Force putting modified C-135 transport aircraft in the air, filled with uh, equipment 
and battle staffs acting as airborne command posts. They were uh, flying 24-7 for a good number of years. Those aircraft were in the sky with one mission only. If we had to launch nuclear war and the ability to direct the launching of the war was compromised because the ground-based control stations were destroyed, the looking glass aircraft could issue those orders. They could direct the ICBMs to launch and they could direct the bombers to go do their business. The problem was these looking glass aircraft could not talk to the third leg of the triad. They could not talk to submerged ICBM uh, submarines. The only way they could talk to the submarines is if the submarines surfaced. Submarines don't want to surface. You lose your stealthiness. So we had to fix that problem. And something called TACAMO, which we'll talk about, did exactly that, and it does that to this day. Turns out TACAMO aircraft have been based right here at Pax River since 1964, and that looking glass mission to talk to all three legs of the triad has been performed here since 19, or has been performed by aircraft here since 1998. So TACAMO got its start after the Cuban Missile Crisis when this inability to talk to submerged nuclear submarines uh, became a real problem. And the commander of the Naval Air Development Center up in Warminster, Pennsylvania was told, you gotta develop an airborne means to transmit presidential nuclear attack orders to these submarines while they're submerged. And they did that. The NADC developed a very low frequency radio system. They put it on the aircraft you see on the screen. They tested it and by 1963 it was obvious that it worked. They called their system TACAMO, which is an acronym for take charge and move out. This is literally the words that were scribbled on the orders that were given to NADC. And that's how urgent this project was. Very shortly after the testing had been completed on that C-121, the gear was taken out of that aircraft and put into a newer aircraft, the C-130 Hercules. You can see the EC-130 here uh, in the photograph. <clears throat> and a year later, we had operational TACAMO uh, contingents set up on the East Coast and on the West Coast. And the East Coast TACAMO squadron was based right here at Pax River. They were a detachment to VR-1, the Fleet Tactical Support Squadron 1. This is the same VR-1 that we talked about in the previous slide uh, when we talked about modified R6Ds that were radio transmitters. So you had these uh, transport aircraft at VR-1's ramp, and then you had this fenced off, walled off, highly secure area where these uh, classified aircraft were, were operating from. And what these TACAMO crews would do is they'd fly up on Pax River and they'd go pretty much all around the world. And they were pretty much in operation 24-7. Well, in 1968, VR-1 leaves Pax River, but the TACAMO aircraft remain behind. And these aircraft are now assigned to a new squadron, uh, VQ-4, Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron 4. Over time, TACAMO moves away from these propeller-driven aircraft into the jet era, and now we've got Boeing 707s. The TACAMO aircraft uh, in roughly 1991 uh, is this E-6A Mercury. But about a year later, VQ-4 moves out of Pax River. They go to Tinker Air Force Base, but just as when VR-1 moved, the TACAMO aircraft stay here. And now they're assigned as a detachment to this, off at Air, this uh, Tinker Air Force Base uh, VQ-4 squadron. They're still here at Pax River. And today they're operating the newer version of the Takamo aircraft, the E-6B. It's got a few more lumps and things on it than it did back in 1991, but the same basic aircraft design. And oh, by the way, it uses the same very low frequency radio system that NADC developed back in 1962. Now it puts out 200 kilowatts of power, and it pumps that power through two really long antennas. One of those antennas is a half mile long, and the other antenna is five miles long. Those antennas dangle nearly vertically below the aircraft while the aircraft fries very slow, circle, uh, very slow circles in the slot, uh, sky, just slightly above stall speed. Submarines receive those radio transmissions by trailing very long wires of their own through the water, and that's, that's how TACAMO functions. I mentioned these aircraft also have a looking glass mission. That looking glass mission is not flown from Pax River directly. What happens is a Pax River aircraft, if the, if the word ever came up to go do this, would fly to Offutt Air Force Base, uh, and some very senior Air Force officers would go in the back of these aircraft, and that battle staff would be ready to command and control all the nuclear forces in the United States. So if the president so directs, and if the ground-based communication system is down, these aircraft would direct the ICBMs to launch, they would direct the bombers to go, and they would direct the submarines to do their thing. And oh, by the way, it's an important mission, at least one looking glass TACAMO aircraft is on alert at all times, not necessarily airborne, but ready to go. The closing thought here is the obvious one. The TACAMO community here at Pax River is, is, they're ready to fight a war that absolutely no one wants. Yes, the Cold War is over, but uh, the threat of nuclear war remains. I don't think I need to say very much more about that.
So it's the people of these squadrons that are Pax River's forgotten cold warriors. I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you their stories and, and I thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit about them. I recognize that many of these folks are only transient members of our community. They were here only as long as their squadrons are here. But there are others who remained after the tours ended and some of them are here today. You may know some of them. You may be one of the folks or maybe one of the descendants of folks who were here at Pax River during the Cold War. And of course, for the folks who gave their lives serving our country, Southern Maryland was the last place they called home. I think it's important we remember them. Here at the Pax River Naval Air Museum, remembering is what we do. We're here to preserve the legacy of Naval Air Station Patuxent River and to educate and inspire folks about this amazing national and local resource. Thanks for watching.